Thanks, uh, Sherry. It's lovely to be here. And anybody who teaches knows that whenever you walk into a new classroom, you're always racked with doubt. That it could be a total bomb. Um, students could be hopeless. You could be dreadful. Um, and so I'm always just uh, racked with doubt when I go into these classrooms. But today was really exceptionally wonderful. I loved all the students in the class. And I don't know if they are required, the way they were required to throw a potluck for me, whether the poets and nonfiction writers are required under pain of death to look interested and, uh, <coughs> and take notes and all of that. I don't know, but they were. And it was really <laughs> wonderful. Uh, because, you know, it's bad enough trying to teach fiction when you're a writer of fiction, but then to have to teach things to do with fiction to a bunch of poets and nonfiction writers was like, okay. But they all responded to the writing prompts and they all wrote beautiful stuff and, in fact, quite brilliant work as we discovered. So it was wonderful. Um, it's, it's really great to be here. I'm, this is the first time I'm reading up here, but I've come to a couple of readings during uh, AWP and we had that great party. Um, and I was just stunned, and it might be because I live in Philadelphia and we don't have such beautiful big spaces. Um, I mean, it's bigger than New York, you know, when you go to New York to do a reading, you're kind of, your, your audience is right here, like you can do this. But this is amazing, and you're so lucky to be here, and then discovering that there were these studios that you could use, um, I thought, you know, for, somebody told me it was $70 a month, you could go and write there, I, I would move in. I mean, <laughs> that sounds like such a great deal, a little private room for yourself to come and, and it's fresh and there's no dishes or anything to do. Um, it, that's miraculous. Um, I'm, I'm really glad for these lights because I, even on a good day, even with my glasses, it's hard for me to see. So when the lights were all dim at the beginning, I started to f have this panic that I was going to have to yell, Sherry, put some lights on. But um, okay, so I've read and read from this book for a couple of years now, and um, I, I try to read something new, particularly if there's anybody in the audience who's heard me before. Um, it's not always possible because it depends on how much time you have, but there's something I've never done, and that is uh, to read the end of the book. And I've never been able to do it because in most places, the people haven't read the book, but here I have a whole bunch of students who have been forced to read the book. Um, and I think I can read the end of the book without giving too much away. So I'm going to indulge myself because this, I think, might be the last reading uh, of this book, although I keep saying that and then I end up having to go and read the book again. Um, so I've taken to actually reading from the new book, which is not even published. Uh, and God knows if it will be, but uh, just, just to amuse myself. So, uh, but for those of you who, ha who have not been forced to read the book, I will read the first paragraph. Uh, to, you know, not the prologue, but the actual first paragraph of the first chapter, and then we'll go to the end of the book. Uh, and I won't tell you anything about this. I mean, you don't really need to know. You can just listen to the, to the, uh, to the sound of my lovely voice. <laughs> so this is the first. The listeners. God was not responsible for what came to pass. People said it was karma, punishment in this life for past sins, fate. People said that no beauty was permitted in the world without some accompanying darkness to balance it out. And surely these children were beautiful. But what people said was unimportant. What befell them befell us all. Where is Nihil? Mr. Niles would say to Seren as he came and went, or to Rashmi when she stopped to say hello to him. He's at home, Seren might say, or more specifically, he's reading. What is he reading? Poems by R. L. Stevenson, Seren would say, or Red Sky at Morning, or The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, or The Catcher in the Rye but never the books of easy, down-to-earth mystery and adventure that he had once loved. Is he playing cricket? Mr. Niles asked this of Rashmi, not Surain, not because he hoped it was true, but because he had to ask, had to know if there was even the faintest possibility that Nihil would go back to what he had loved. No, Rashmi said, nobody plays cricket down our lane anymore. Everybody is growing up. She used that word because that is what she had heard said of them. All our children are growing up, 
by the adults on Salman Lane whenever they spoke about the quietness of the road. And that growing up, what was it? For the children were still children, full of wishes, wish fulfillment still imaginable. The growing up was this. Each of them had moved away from a simpler past, one where nothing that happened beyond Salma Lane had ever seemed to apply to them. Some had shifted a small distance, like Mohan and Jeth, some much further, like Rose and Dolly, who mourned for the brother they had always feared, but who had nonetheless been a part of them. And still others, like Surain and Rashmi and Nihil, with the wide open space left behind by Devi, had travelled an even greater distance away from childhood. Not even for practice, Mr. Nihil asked, for he knew that without having to be told, there would be no more grames of cricket played down that road, not for a long time, and that when those games resumed with other children, he would be gone. No, he hasn't gone for practice since, and Rashmi stopped there. Ask him to come and see me, Mr. Nihil asked this of Surain. And because asking was possible, though forcing him to come was not, Surain said, I will ask him to come. Mr. Niles waited, that day, the next, the following week, the week after that. Nihil did not come. It would be a good thing if you went to see Mr. Niles, Surain said. Nihil looked up from the book he was reading. I don't want to see Mr. Niles. I don't play the piano anymore, and there's no reason for me to go there. He's an old man, and he won't be here much longer, Surain said. Nihil had turned back to his book, and this time he did not look up, but he heard. And when he heard those words that alluded to death, he thought of Thevi. He thought about the words she, he might have said to her, don't go so fast, or even stop. He thought of what he might have done as he watched her come so light and happy, of how he might have thrown himself in front of the bike, and how she might have flown off the bike, and she might have hit old Mrs. Joseph's gate, or might have simply crashed to the ground and bruised her knees and shins and her elbows and palms, and might have even hit her head, but she would not have died. He was sure of it, she would not have died. And if she had lived, what would he have said to her? He would have said what he needed to say to her, the words of chastisement that would keep her safe. You were going too fast, I had to stop you. No more of this bike, I'm going to ask Roger to take it back. What is the matter with you? Do you know, do you think this is the time to be riding bikes up and down the road? Have you forgotten that our neighbor's gardens are still filled with ash? Have you forgotten that Roger's mother is half paralyzed? Ah, yes, those are the words he would have said. He would not have said other words, the words he wanted to say after, after she could no longer hear him. Come inside, I will play battleships with you. I'll double you on the bike until you can ride it alone. You can bring me my lunch at the next match I play. I will buy you an icy chalk and an ice palm and a cold bottle of Coca-Cola too. You can hold the kite. How could he have known that they were the words, the only ones that were worth saying? How could he know being just a child, being just a human with human sight? And what would Devi have said had she been able to speak, Nihil wondered, if she had been able to say anything at all? What is it that she would have said to him? I am sorry, I was happy, it was not your fault. Neil closed his book as those words came to him, hearing them in Devi's voice, understanding at last that the love he felt for Devi had always been equaled by the love she had for him, understanding that she would have kept herself safe had her safety guaranteed his happiness, understanding also that no such guarantees can ever be made. The last voice that Mr. Niles heard as he slipped out of consciousness and into the death that had been promised him, the one that had not arrived within the six months given, that had waited long enough for him to meet a boy, such a boy as this, to love him and lose him and have him return to him again, the last voice he heard was Neil's. For a day and into the best part of that night, pausing only for the soup and tea that Mrs. Niles brought for him, Nihil read aloud to Mr. Niles. Go and fetch the two grey-covered books on top of my chest of drawers, son. 
That was the first thing he had said when Nihil pushed open the door and came into the house. He had said that even as he lay there, his eyes shut, knowing who had come, though Nihil had not said a word. Nihil went into Mr. Niles' bedroom, the one in which he hadn't slept for almost a year. He breathed in the smell of clean things freshly washed, the bed so crisp as though Mr. Nile, Mrs. Niles expected that on any given evening her husband might stand up and retire to sleep in his own bed and not remain in quiet rest on the mattress in the veranda. There was no dust there, not on the bureau or under the bed, nor on the bat that was laid at the bottom of the bed. The bat that he saw was still tagged with his own name, but that he did not pick up. My mother and father gave these books to me when I took my university entrance exams. We were still living in Jaffna, in my childhood home. These books, they were new then, Mr. Niles said, when Nihil gave him the books. You were young then, Nihil said, and those were his first words. When he said them, Nihil found that they did not sound loud and strange as he had imagined they would. They sounded as though he had never left this place this place beside Mr. Niles, who had listened to him and heard him, and who had always, even on the very first day they met, told him the truth. Mr. Niles handed the books back to Nihil. They were written by the knight of Newbold Revel, Sir Thomas Mallory. They are for you. He did not ask Nihil to read to him, but Nihil did. The tale that he read was one he understood. It was a tale of striving for high ideals amid human frailty, turmoil, and change. It was a tale of betrayal and love. And though he wanted very much to start with the last word and read it backward, to say, Rutra for het ed, het for dne, het si ere dna, he began with the first words. It befell in the days, and he read them forward, whole as they had been written. That's it.